many ways to worship God, and that's one of them. That is one of them. Is in praise to the Lord. Thank you, Father. Amelia, thank you for that word. Thank you for that truth. I love it when people are so honest. And you can tell the honesty rather than the facade. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Carly, for the song. We praise the Lord. Our young people are taking over. Amen. Taking over. Well, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. We've been talking about worship for a while, and it's been a while since I've talked about worship, too. Uh, I think it's been three weeks since I've been here um, to, to preach, and the Lord, um, the Lord is amazing in all facets of that word. He is amazing. Psalms 95 and verse 6 and 7 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Now here it is. For He is our God. Amen. He is our Lord. That's just one of the many Psalms that talks about and exhorts us, you and I, to worship the Father. And we are to do this on a daily basis. Every day of our living is to be a worship before the Father. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we've read them before. And it says... I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, or therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and those mercies, they're all the truths of the first 11 chapters. All the absolutes of those first 11 chapters, you and I cannot change those absolutes. God died on the cross for us, gave his life for you and me, and that's the doctrine, the absolutes of God. Whether you accept it or not is a choice that you will make. God chooses you to accept it. You will make the choice yourself, but you can never change those absolutes. God went to the cross and he died for us. And so Paul said on those 11 chapters of absolutes, I'm going to beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, one that is holy, One that is acceptable unto who? Unto God, which is your reasonable service, or it's literally your spiritual worship. In fact, I will tell you, well, in verse 2 it says that you may what? That you may prove what is that good. And are you with me? And acceptable and perfect will of God. In fact, your destiny is determined by your worship. You see, the people who worship God acceptably, well, they, they enter into eternal life. But those people who worship God unacceptably... Will they enter into eternal damnation? I believe we're looking at a people today, and I'm looking at you as those who worship God acceptably. There are only two kinds of worship acceptable, unacceptable. Amen? 
We've been talking about unacceptable for the last, or three weeks ago, for the last three weeks or four weeks. We've been talking about the unacceptable worship. And the first unacceptable worship was the worship of false gods. God said, I'll have, you can have no other God before me. You can never come to God and bring your other gods because God will not accept it at all. The second kind of unacceptable worship is the worship that we give to the true God in the wrong form. I mean, you can worship false gods, God will not accept it. Nor will he accept the worship of the true God that is offered in the wrong way. Moses was at the top of the mountain receiving the gifts of God. He was receiving the word of God and God wrote in his own handwriting on two tablets of stone. He came down out of the mountain and Aaron was leading the people in worship of a golden calf. He broke, the, he broke those commandments in pieces and God killed 3,000 of those people because of their worship of the true God in the wrong form. The third unacceptable worship was the worship of the true God in some self-styled manner. Aaron, the high priest, he had two boys. They got, I guess they were around 30 years of age, and they went into the priesthood. On the very first day that they went into the priesthood, their names were Nadab and Abihu. And they went in to lead the people in worship, and they got drunk. And they went into the tabernacle and they began to fool around and do the things that were not according to God's law. And the Bible says that God devoured them with fire on the very first day of their job because of unacceptable worship. You say, well, pastor, what is acceptable worship? When the woman at the well was looking at Jesus, she said, Jesus, we worship in the mountains, you worshiped Jerusalem. And Jesus said, lady, there's a day that's coming and it's here now that you will neither worship God in the mountains or in Jerusalem, but you will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so today I'm going to give you the fourth unacceptable worship. And that is the worship of the true God in the wrong attitude. How many has got an attitude that's wrong sometimes? A lot of times. You see, if we eliminate all the false gods in our life, and even if we eliminated all the images of the true God, and if we got real strong and eliminated all of our self-styled modes of worship, I can tell you that our worship would still be unacceptable if our heart attitude isn't right. You said this kind of unacceptable worship, I will tell you, hits us where we live because it probably affects every one of us. I think very few of us worship a false god. I think very few of us in this room, we worship an image of a, of a true god I would think that very few of us and most of us, I don't even think we even invent our own ways of worship because we try to worship God according to the scripture. But the question that each of us needs to answer is this. Do I have the right attitude? Because if you don't, it's unacceptable worship. And it's unacceptable to God. He will not receive it. Let me show you just in a few passages if I can. Turn to Malachi, if you would. You're there in, if you're in the New Testament, just keep going to the left and you will find Matthew and just keep going to the left. The next guy is Malachi, to the left. Malachi chapter one. Malachi, he is a prophet. He's one of the minor prophets in the Bible. But the words that come out of his mouth are not minor. They are very serious and very elite. Malachi is, you know what a prophet is? A prophet just speaks for God. 
A prophet speaks the words of God. God wanted the people of Israel to know and the prophet is speaking to the children of Israel. And here the prophet Malachi is indicting the children of Israel because God is speaking through him. And he's indicting the people of God because of their sin. And in this marvelous, beautiful prophecy, the prophecy points out at least seven different kinds of monumental sins of which they were all guilty of. But the one that stands out, the one that somehow dominates them all is the one that they were involved in worshiping God with the wrong attitude. You see, they were just going through the motions. They were just going through the actions and the motions of worship rather than genuinely giving their heart. See, their hearts, the Bible says, were so far away from God. They were just walking through those motions of worship. How many has ever done that? Let me see your hands. You can tell the truth here because we're all, you know, seven of you told the truth. The rest of you are just simply not telling the truth. Let's look at Malachi's indictment starting in verse 6. Now this is God speaking through Malachi. This is the word of the Lord and he's talking to the children of Israel. Let's just come down to where we are. He's speaking to Southside. He's speaking to the children of God, the works of God, the will of God. And here's what God said through Malachi the prophet. And Malachi said... And God's word said, a son honors his father, and a servant honors his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear or my respect or my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts, O priests that despise my name. And you say, well, Where have we despised your name? (laughs) Right? And you offered, God said, and you offered polluted bread upon my altar. And they said, wherein have we polluted you? And God said, in that you say that the table or the altar of the Lord is contemptible. You want to know what they were doing? Here's what they were doing. They were treating their worship before God as if it was contemptible. What do you mean, preacher? As if it was worthless. As if it was something that was beneath their... um, their, um, um, uh, Consideration. For them to consider doing this was beneath them. They had come to this place where they, had, they felt contemptible about their worship. You see, they were strictly going through their functions of it. They were going through the routine and the ritual of, of worshiping God rather than their heart being in it. And not only was their heart not involved in it, but they were actually bringing to God that that was least rather than that which was the best. What do you mean? Now, before we pounce on them with both feet, may I remind you here, folks, that I remind you that having contempt for worship is coming to worship with any kind of wrong attitude, any kind. Sometimes I come through those doors and my attitude is wrong. Sometimes I go in my closet at home and my attitude is wrong. Someone has affected me somewhere or I have allowed them to affect me and somehow or another I am affected before I can worship or when I go to worship and my mind is not there. My heart is far from it. Now what are you doing? What are they doing? Look at verse 8. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice... You see what they were doing. They were offering these blind animals for sacrifice. And God told them exactly how to bring their sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. And he gave them absolute truths of how they were to worship God. 
how they were to bring that into the tabernacle of God. And here's what God said. Is it not evil what you're doing? In other words, what they were doing, they would bring these blind and these uh, blind animals and sacrifice them on the altar of God because they were useless to them. See, a blind animal once, you, you, you see, since it was going to have difficulty, it couldn't see and difficult finding any food, he would probably die anyway, so let's just get rid of it. What are we going to do? Let's just bring it to God. Let's just bring him our stuff. You know what? When we have food drives and, and uh, we bring our food, we go to the cupboard and what do we do? We find the can that is expired. And it's easy to go to that. You know, I did that the last time. I looked at those and I said, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's right at the date and, and, uh, and, and it's right there close to it. And you know, by the way, the government says that that's really not an expired can of food. But my wife, she looked at it and she said, I said, well, I think we can give that too, don't you? And she said, no. I said, now why not? It's not expired. Well, the can says it's expired. Put it down. And I said, now, baby, I'm telling you, I believe we can send this and send some other stuff and uh, all that. She said, no, that's not what we're going to eat. She said, open it and eat it yourself. <laughs> In so many words. So I threw it in the trash. In addition to all of that, the blindness might have been caused by some disease. And so what they were doing, they were offering God these, design, these diseased animals that were blind, full of, they were, they were sick animals. And they worship, when they would come to worship, they would offer God that which, you know what, they just simply could not use. And the priests we're in the leadership of all this. Now look at verse, t verse 8. You know, you know for, for, before I go any further, you know, sometimes we offer God worship when we have the time. Not when we make the time, but when we have the time. Whether we are golfing, whether we're fishing, whether we are tending to the family, or whether we're out preaching or whatever we're doing, we think that we're giving God our time when really what we're doing, we're giving Him the time that we cannot use. And sometimes we come to church, we open the doors, and we say, let's go to church today and let's give Him because we don't have anything else to do. Or it's just that time, it's really not in my heart. You see, what God is looking for is your heart. He's not looking for really the activity. He wants the heart before the activity. Because if he can get that heart, all the activity will come to light. Amen? God wants your heart, not your activity first. Verse 8 continues and says, And if you offer the lame and the sick, God said, is it not evil? When we come to God and we come to worship, whether it's at home or whether it's at here, wherever it may be, if it is my friend, if it is sick, worship. If it's lame, worship. Is it not evil? And then he gets a little sarcastic, I think, and God speaks through Malachi and he says, and he says to him, he said, well, now, why don't you offer it to your governor? Why don't you take it down to the IRS? You know, what, why don't you, right here in April the 15th, why don't you give the IRS and tell them, say, oh, I know I owe this, but this is what I'm going to give. See if your governor will receive you. See if the government will allow you to get through with all of that stuff, you see. He says, offer it now unto your governor. Will he be pleased with you or will he accept your person? In other words, will he be favorable to you? Will he act kindly to you? Well, that's all right. Well, you know, you can ride on our roads and you don't have to pay anything. Just come on and do what you want to do, says the Lord of hosts. And now he said, I pray you, I'm going to beseech, he said, I pray you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to beseech God that he will be gracious unto us or favorable unto us. This has been at your means 
or uh, it would be favorable unto uh, uh, and gracious unto us. That uh, this has been at your means. Will he regard you, your person, favorably? Will he look at you very favorably? You see, if we go to the governor and we say, listen, I don't want to give it all, but I do want to give you a pence. Will he receive you willingly? You know, sometimes when we go to God, we go to God. You know, we're a people that want all the time. Can I get an amen? And when we go to God in prayer and when we go to God in worship, we're, we're not really worshiping. We're going in petitioning God for this and that and the other. When first of all, God is not looking for anything extraordinary except your heart. Because our heart is so far away from God, the Bible says he'll not receive you. Your governor's not going to receive it. And if you, if you think he'll receive any less, here's what God said. He said, said the Lord. In other words, he said, uh, how, how is it? If you treat God like this, how do you think God's going to treat you? I mean, do you think he's going to regard you any differently than you have regarded him? The problem is, is that we're always wanting something, but our heart is not right. Our heart is not ready to receive what God, or our heart is not in worship. Oh God, help me with this bill. Yeah, help me with this bill. But God said, will you first worship me with a true, genuine heart? God's got no responsibility to anyone who is not obedient to him. Come on now, that's biblical. You need to say amen. God doesn't receive you simply because of you. You are his creation. He receives you because you are obedient to the creator. And in that obedience, God then blesses us in return. Amen? Oh, amen, amen, amen. Look at verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for nothing? Neither do they kindle fire on my altar for nothing. In other words, he said, where are the people who will close the door to this nonsense? You coming and asking God for stuff when you yourself have not worshipped from your heart. Who is it that's going to shut this thing down? I mean, who is it that will come to the preacher and say to the preacher, we're not worshipping the way we should. We're not worshipping the way that God has implanted. We're our heart is not in it. When are we going to shut it down? And nobody would come to shut this whole thing down and they kept doing it over and over and over and over again. He said, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. There are some things that God simply will not accept. He will not accept worship that is offered in some materialized, self-styled, half-hearted way. He does not, he has not, and he will not. Amen. Amen. Now I know you think that this is a scold on you, but it is not. I want you to say amen every now and then because you know it's true and you know it hurts. Amen. And you know, your pastor is guilty before he begins to say anything else. We need a heart that is in tune with the Lord. We need what God wants us to be. A heart man who is willing to, to surrender to God in any moment, at any time. Why? Because that's what God's looking for is a surrendered, obedient heart before the Lord. Look at verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, he said, my name shall be great among the nations and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, what he said, he says, if you don't praise God, I, he said, my name will be praised. My name will be adored. My name will be glorified. And whether, whether I do it, whether the preacher does it, or whether you do it, he said, I'm still going to receive praise and I know how to get it and I can get it and one day it will come. So what he says to us, you must worship God. God told them to bring that pure offering. It had to be a, a, a lamb in his flock. It had to be the best lamb without any spot, without any blemish. But they weren't doing it. They knew exactly what God said in the book of Leviticus. They knew exactly what the ordinance was, but they weren't doing it. They were bringing these blind animals for sacrifice. 
Verse 12 through 24, look at that. I mean 12 through 14. But you've profaned it. You've profaned it. You know what that is? You profane my name. In verse 11, they profane. He said, he said, my name shall be great among the nations. He said, but you, the children of God, you who were the leaders of the, of the, of the world to find so that the world will know how to find me, Jehovah God, and you have profaned, profaned my name. You have almost cursed my name through the nations. And every nation that looks, they do not see me as God. They see me as some, weak, some weakness somewhere because my own people will not worship the way that I've called you to worship. He says, you profane my name in that you say, the table of the Lord or the, the altar of the Lord is polluted. And you say the fruit thereof, even his meat, it's contemptible. I mean, they, they despised the table of God. And you also said, Behold, what a weariness is it. In other words, how tiresome this is. How tiring it is to worship God over and over again like this. Josephus, the, uh, the, the early church um, historian, he said at the time of Jesus, he said during the Passover there were 250,000 lambs slain. Blood from the top of those priests to the bottom of their boots and everything and it stunk to high heaven. Why? Because there was no good odor anywhere and all of these animals being, being slaughtered and it ran down the Kidron Brook, the, the blood, and he said, I'm tired of it. And so they said, how tiresome this stuff is. How weariness. You sniffed at it, said the Lord of hosts. And you brought that which was torn. You brought that which was lame. You brought the sick. That He said, thus you brought this offering to me. You brought it to me just like this. And sick. It's a sick offering. Thus. Thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this at your hand, says the Lord? Should I? I don't know, Pastor. You don't know what kind of week I've had. It doesn't matter what kind of week we've had. What matters is what's in our heart and what God receives from you, no matter what the week unfolds before us. God's looking for your heart, your heart of worship. Hallelujah. Amen. And he said, but cursed be the deceiver. You who are swindling God, you think you can bring any kind of worship before God? You think you can come on a Sunday morning, open the door and come and appease God? God knows your heart before you got out of bed. And our attitude when we get here is, you know, it's just another Sunday. We got to go through this motion again. We got to go through this, this agro, you know, we got to do the things that we, you know, we're just tired of doing them. I mean, I could be fishing. I could be kayaking. I could be working and making money. I could be doing this. I could be doing that. I could be, I could have a vacation with my family. Verse 14 says, but cursed be the deceiver. You think you're deceiving? You can't. You deceived everybody else, but you're not deceiving me, God. God says you're not deceived. You're a swindler. You're bringing this lame worship, you, which has, and you, the swindler, which has in your flock a male, and you vow it. And you sacrifice it unto the Lord. It's a corrupt thing. In other words, you see, in the Old Testament, they were talking about uh, how to do this. And they were to bring a male, the best male lamb out of the flock. And what these people were doing were bringing the female and they were, uh, they were sick and lame and blind before God. And God said, it's a corrupt thing. I told you how to do it and you're doing it the wrong way. And so he says to them, he says, I'm a great king. You think the governor is great? You think the governor will not accept what you want, what you're giving? I will tell you, I'm a great king. I'm a king above the governor. I'm a king above all governments. Hallelujah. I am the great 
greatest of all. I am the Lord, the creator. I am the Lord of hosts and my name is dreadful and it's terrible and it will go forever among the heathen. Somebody somewhere is going to know how to praise my name because their heart is right with me. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. The priests, they were the leaders in this whole sin, but you see it just trickled it. It fell down all the way through to the people themselves and the whole system was rotten from the top to the bottom and they had contempt for their worship. They were tired of worshiping. Tired of bringing that good lamb to the table of the Lord. And the key is in verse 13. And that key verse says, Behold, what a weariness to them. The whole exercise of worship, you see, was, was just a big pain in the neck. I mean, Ethel, get up. It's Sunday morning. Get up. Get the kids dressed. We got to go to church. What a pain in the neck it is to be able to have to do this Sunday after Sunday. Or, 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 or what a pain in the neck to get up so early in the morning before I go to work to fall on my face before God and worship. When it came to worship, they probably said something like this. What, what a drag this is. I mean, what a, what a load it, this is. It's a drag. We have to go down there and worship again. Got to get this animal. And, and hey, Johnny, go out there and, and get, that, uh, uh, get that last uh, lamb, the one that has a lame leg and the one that's blind and bring it. We'll offer it to God. We don't need it. Huh. They went through the function, you see. They went through the form of worship, but their hearts were so far from it that God said, I don't want it anymore. There, wasn't no, there was no reality there whatsoever. In chapter 3, they even went, leave, it, it, it went further. In chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14, and apparently they started bad-mouthing God while they were doing it. And God said this, He said, Your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against you? And he said, you have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? In other words, they decided they didn't make enough money worshiping God. They didn't make enough money serving the Lord. It wasn't enough profit in serving God. There's enough preachers out there that have that same mentality that there's not enough profit in serving the Lord. And so they, what they do is, is they, they, they will do anything else except that. And here's the results of it, of that unacceptable worship that you bring to God in chapter 4. In chapter 4 it says this, verse 1. For behold the day's coming that shall burn as an oven and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Whoo! Verse 3. And you shall tread down the wicked and, you shall, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says the Lord of hosts. You see, Malachi is showing these people of God had come to the place where they were worshiping the true God in the right way, right? In the true way, but they had a wrong attitude. Their attitude stunk to high heaven and their hearts were not in it. They were going through the motions. Now look, look at your own heart. Look at your own man, your own woman, your own person. And you say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, Pastor. I don't, fall, I, I don't worship false gods. And we don't worship false gods in this place. No, uh, you know, I, I worship the true God. I, I, I haven't even invented, I, I've not reduced him to an image. And I know I'm not supposed to. I haven't even invented my own way of worship. In fact, I worship the best I know according to the scripture. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to worship according to his word. But now let me ask you this question. Is your heart in your worship is your heart sold out to God when it comes time to give look at me when you, when it comes time to give do you give the best of all that you have or do you take out that lame gift 
See, when it comes time to make your promises to God, do you make him those promises that is the most reflective of his generosity to you? That God marvelously saved and delivered you? Is your heart filled with awe? Is it filled with reverence? Is your heart, and listen, if your heart is not right, I will tell you your worship is pointless and it's unacceptable to God. Now, since I haven't run anybody off, let's go to the left, to Amos. Amos, just a few pages over. Amos. He's like the little kid when mama told him, he said, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. And, 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 and he wouldn't sit down. She kept saying, sit down, sit down. And, and finally he sat down he's, and, and he's, he said, mama, said, mama, I'm sitting down on the outside, but on the inside I'm standing up. <laughs> Don't stand up on me now. Hang on. Hang on with me. Amos. Amos chapter 5. Here's what God said. Now, God is speaking through Amos again. And here's what he's saying. Are you all right? Is anybody bored? I got, a, I got a broom and a mop out there. If you're bored, we can. Here's what God said. Verse 21. I hate. Are, are you talking to me, God? I hate. I despise your feast days. The days that you brought together in the feast that I have ordinized, for, that I've made ordinance for you, in those days that you were supposed to give me praise, I despise them. What? And I will not take delight in your solemn assemblies. In other words, I can't stand your worship. I can't stand it. When I looked at these words and I thought within myself, I said, Father, I said, when I, when I come to my worship time, where is my heart? Where is my mental mind? Where is my own physical spirit? Where am I in my genuine worship before you, Father? Verse 22, he says, Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meal offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. You see, now they're even offering these good animals, you see, and they're fat and they're fluffy and all that and, and such. He says, and they were doing it the right way externally, but here's what the God will not accept it because their heart wasn't right. If nobody's going to be convicted today, Pastor Sullivan... Both of them will be convicted. Verse 23 continues and says, Take away from me the noise of your songs. For I will not hear the melody of your heart, of your harps. You see, you can be the best piano player ever. You can be the best guitar player. You can be the best bass player, the best drummer, the best whatever that is, you can be anything. You can be the best that has ever come. The bongos can never lose a beat. And God says, it stinks to me because your heart is not right. It's melody in my, as, 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 as you hear it. And the songs that you sing, and the singers are singing, and they sing, and they sing. And I'm not talking about just these up here. I'm talking about all these out here. All you're doing is mouthing it, and you're just saying the words, and your heart is not in it. Your spirit is not in it. It's a waste of time. And God said, I'm sick of it. I'm done with it. I don't want it anymore. I don't want your worship that is not from your heart. I don't want it. 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 Oh God, but when you can praise God from those instruments and from your mouth that it comes from your heart like, like Amelia did this morning and, and Carly did this morning, I will tell you it blesses my soul. Not only does it bless me, but it blesses the Heavenly Father because it comes from the heart and the spirit of the man. It worships God and God is honored when it happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. That's all right. Verse 24 said, but, but let justice run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. 
Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of your Molech and your Chion and your images and the star of your God, he said, which you made to yourselves. He said, because you've done that, therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And you say, now, hey, wait, 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 wait. You're talking about Old Testament stuff. God doesn't feel that way. God never changes. He is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. He always feels the same way. Even when he made you, when he created man, he had the same idea. And today he feels the same. Don't think for a moment that he does not. The fact that you and I are not killed and liberated is because of his great mercy. The grace that he gives us. In other words, God says, I'm through with you. I'm through with all. He says to Israel, I'm done. On the one hand, you come and you offer these sacrifices and they're beautiful sacrifices. But then on the other hand, you turn right around and you worship other gods. You're so ingrained, you're so engulfed, you're so involved in the system of the world, you stink. You're hypocritical and it's unacceptable. Now, if you're visiting with us today, I beg you to come back again. I'll get sweeter as the day goes by. You don't need to turn to it, but if you want to in, in, in Hosea, just keep going to the left if you want. Hosea, you'll pass Joel, Hosea. Chapter 6, verse 4, 5, 6, and 7. Oh, Ephraim, he's talking of Israel. What shall I do with you? Oh, Judah, what shall I do with you? For your goodness is like the morning cloud and like the early dew, it goes away. I mean, you're good for a little while, but it doesn't last long. I mean, you stink after a while. Therefore have I hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. I have sent the prophets and they kept cutting and cutting and cutting away. And, and after a while, there's nothing left. I have slain them with the words of my mouth and thy judgments are the light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They, is it there have they dealt treacherously against me? Wow. Wow. You say, Pastor, I hope you're done. I'm not done. Go to the left. Now, she's not mad at me. She's got to go preach somewhere. Amen. Go to Isaiah, to the left, chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? You're hearing? You're hearing what the Lord is saying, more importantly. We pray the Lord and the anointing of God upon them as they go and preach the word. Again, God is indicting Judah, Israel, in a similar way that he indicted Amos. Only this time he's doing it through through Isaiah. Now listen to this. And, and it sort of sounds a little sarcastic to me. But God says through Isaiah, he said, to what purpose? Say it with me. To what purpose? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? You know God already knew the answer, right? To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of the fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of the he goats. In other words, God says, I've had it. I'm through with you. I don't want it anymore. I'm sick of it. Verse 12 continues. And when you come to appear before me, he said, who hath required this at your hand to tread in my courts? Verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Don't bring the incense. That incense is an abomination unto me. You know, the incense that I told you about, it was that fragrance that went up into the nostrils of God and it was only made for him. He said, even now, I don't want that because your heart is not... not you know, let me just give you a little, a, 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 a little lesson God, the animals, the incense, God didn't need them. 
They were just the representation of what was supposed to be in the offerer of it all. Because what God was looking for was a man who would go to the flock and pick out the best that he had and he would come, and the priest would build this perfume and it would go up into the nostrils of God because their heart wanted to please God. The animals did not, suck, did not please the Lord. It was the heart of the man. Isn't, isn't that exactly what God is after today? Is the heart of the man? Is the soul of the man? Is the mental of the man? The mentality? Everything about the man that God wants is him. Not blood. Not an animal. But he wanted you. He wanted the children of Israel. And he says, I'm sick of your offerings to me because your heart is so far away from me. It's sickening to me. I can't stand it anymore. He says, the new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot bear it. It's an iniquity. It's a lifestyle, he said. That's not just sin. That means a lifestyle. That's your lifestyle now. Even the solemn meetings. I, I can't stand your Sunday go meeting time. Say, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary of, being, of bearing them. And when you spread forth your hands, look, 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 look. When you spread forth your hands, I'll not, I, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, and when you make many prayers, I'll not hear it. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. And then he says, no, I love it, I love it. He said, he said you know, you know what you've done. Now go wash. And go wash yourselves. Glory to God. Go wash yourselves. Wash and make you clean. Put away all that evil of your doings from before mine eyes and cease to do evil. Stop bringing your lame as worship and sacrifice to me. I don't want it. I want you. I want you. Hallelujah to God. And I believe in my heart that there are people that are willing to, that are ready to worship right now. But hang on, hang on. I, I'm telling you, I'm t and this is part of worship is hearing the word of God and listening to the word of God and allowing the word of God to enter into your spirit. Now, now listen, wash yourself and make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease from doing that evil. Learn to do well and seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. And I love verse 18. Now come. When you do that now, come. Come and what? Let us, I love this phrase, let us reason together, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And you say, well, preacher, how in the world can I be like, like white as snow? And how can I be like wool of, the, of a fresh lamb that, is, that has no blemish on it? And he says here, he says, he says, if you be willing and if you be obedient to God, you shall, you, oh, hallelujah, you shall eat the good of the land. It is only when we're obedient to God and our worship comes before God and we fall on the Lord and we say, God, I'm a miserable man without you. I need you and everything about you. And until I get it, I, I know you will not receive me. And I come and I wash myself at the feet of Jesus. I cleanse myself at the cross of Calvary. Verse 20, but if you refuse to do it, and if you rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You say, oh, no, 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 preacher. God's changed his mind about everything. Wrong. God hasn't changed his mind about your worship. God has not changed his mind about your heart, about the intents of the man or the woman that comes before the Father. He has never changed his mind. That's what he wants is your heart in your worship, is your heart in your praise. And I know we sometimes we run around and we say, you know, give the Lord a praise. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a praise. Where is your heart? 
Is it in your heart or is it just the words you speak? Do we just say them or do we genuinely mean them? And when we mean them from the heart, God said, I will receive it unto myself. And I, oh hallelujah, I'm going to go to a place and I'm going to make another place for you so that you can be, oh hallelujah, with me forever and ever in the heavens above. That's the blessing we're looking for. Come on, somebody give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. But Israel rebelled and they refused. The Bible says they refused the invitation to salvation. You say, well, Pastor, what in the world is your point? Malachi, it doesn't matter if you use Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, whoever they are, the people were doing the right thing to the right God in the right way, but they had the wrong attitude. And God doesn't accept it. And never has and never will. Mark chapter 7 verse 6. I'll read it to you quickly. It's the same thing as what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15. He that's talking about Jesus answered and said unto them the Pharisees. Well hath Isaiah prophesied to you hypocrites. As it is written this people honors me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. And that is unacceptable worship. Our programs won't do it. Do, 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 do you hear me, church? Our programs won't do it. And simply because you get up out of bed and you come to this place on a Sunday, you, you may appease your own mindset, but it doesn't appease God because He, he knows where your heart is before you even showed up. God's looking for a man with his heart in tune with the Lord. If you worship the true God in the right way, but with the wrong attitude, God will not accept it. And I will tell you, it will determine your destiny. God can't accept anyone who is unacceptable. Your heart must be clean. But there's another kind of worship. And it's called acceptable worship. And I'm going to finish. Sweetheart, come to the piano for just a moment. Now listen, look, look, look this way. Keep going to the left. Just keep going to the left. To Psalms. Chapter 24. I love this. Psalms chapter 24. You see, I've been bottled up all for a whole month and, and almost a month. And this is what you get when I get bottled up. Now I'm trying to find a place to quit, Al, and I don't know what to do with myself. Here's, here's chapter 24. Verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord? I mean, who, who's going to be able to get up there with the Lord? Or who shall stand in His holy place? I mean, who in the world will God accept? Which one of you in this room will God accept? He says, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. He who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He's the one that will receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek his face. You see, those who are acceptable to God. See, those who are true, genuine worshipers are the ones who have clean hands. You say, well, Pastor, what's clean hands? The clean hands is obedient to God, reverent to God. You're purified. You've been made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you've got a pure heart. In other words, your motives, your desires are right. They're not wrong. You don't come and you keep asking God and asking God and you fail to give your heart completely to the Lord. He says those are the ones who truly, truly seek Him. So when that woman came to Jesus, 
she said to him, in the mountains we worship and you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus just simply said to him, he said, said, lady, there's coming a time and no, 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 no. It's here now. It's right here. And we won't worship in the mountain or in Jerusalem. In other words, what he was saying, that's, you don't have to worry about making that, mega, me, what, that Mecca all the way over there. No, no, no. All you need to do is get your heart right. He said, they that worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. The spirit of the man, the real man, the whole man, not just the body, not just the, not just the mind, the spirit. It, it's everything you fall before God and you worship before the Lord. You say, God, that's what I want. Is that you in this room? Do, is that you? God, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to be a pleasure to you. For you were made me for that one purpose, to please you. And for no other reason did you build me. God did not save you to bless you. And that's coming later. God saved you for his blessing. For his honor. For his glory. And the reason that he wants your heart is because he cannot get glory from you, his creation, without your heart. Without your genuine desire, I want to worship you, Lord. I want to, I want to serve you, God. I want to be obedient to you. And no matter what comes or goes, that's what I want more than anything in the world. Is that you today? Is that you? Is that you? Frankie, is that what you want? Is, is, is that what you want, Marvin? I want to be pleasing to the Lord, right? I want to be pleasing so many times I'm not. And God, and, and I know when God receives me and I know when he doesn't. Can I get an amen? You know that. You know exactly how God feels about you. And you wonder, you say, well, I wonder how God feels. No, you don't wonder. You know. If there's no connection there, it's because your heart isn't there. If your heart isn't there, there is a separation. And God said, I want your heart more than I want your sacrifices. And I don't, don't bring me all of this lame stuff coming in the building every Sunday. I want you to come with your heart open to me. And when you get there, you can't wait to get to the praise part. You can't wait to get to the worship part. And you say, God, I am ready and I'm willing if there's anybody willing in this room today, I want you to stand to your feet if you would. Stand up if you're willing to come and worship God. If you're willing to come and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my, forgive me when I do not please you in my worship. I'm coming now to worship you, Father. I want to worship you, Lord. I want to praise you, God. I want to honor who you are and what you are and who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you want